connectivity. I now give the floor to Wesley so that you can see and start with this panel so you can open the panel. <laughs> He is speaking in Guarani, and he said, welcome, dear friends, to LACNIC 42, LACNIC 2024 in the city of Asuncion. For me, it is an honor to chair this panel. We're aware that many landlocked countries in the world have significant difficulties in their connectivities. There are two countries in our region, precisely Paraguay and Bolivia. Mediterranean, according to the Spanish uh, landlock country, according to the Spanish dictionary, means a country that has no coast. We know that global connection takes place through submarine cables, and these countries that have no coast are strongly affected in their interconnection. However, Resilient countries such as Paraguay and our sister country Bolivia continue to make progress, strengthening their interconnections and offering the best possible service. Here we have a graph of the growth of the internet in Paraguay in number of users over the recent years. This is from 2019 through 2024. We had a significant increase. We had an increase of 31.37 percent. And I think that much of this growth was a result of the pandemic that increased the need for everyone to be connected. However, this was also the result of a major effort undertaken by operators in our country. We also have an interesting fact. We have 1.29 million persons who are not connected. This shows that there is the efforts are still required. We have to continue to work in order to close that digital gap. This graph impressed me quite a lot. This number was really quite impressive. Within two years, we had an increase of more than 60 percent in the average bandwidth of the bandwidth to the home offered in Paraguay. This shows that barriers are being overcome, and these are being overcome very rapidly. But what can we learn from here? How can we help other countries also to make progress and decrease the digital divide, even though they have no access to the sea. This is what we'll be discussing with the other members of the panels. And let's give our panelists a big round of applause as a welcome. So we will start with an interesting question. This question will be addressed to all the members of the panel. I'd like to listen to your opinion regarding how would you describe the main connectivity channels in a landlocked country, a country that has no access to the sea, and what are the factors that you consider are the most critical ones? Minister. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor and a real pleasure to be here. And to answer your question, the main challenge we face is to generate the conditions so that private investments come into the country. How do we manage to achieve this? We work in promoting the private sector to continue strengthening the networks that connect to the transoceanic connectivity. And this has increased in recent years. We continue to work together with the private sector in order to strengthen connectivity. Today, we have outbound connections through Bolivia, through Argentina, through Brazil. So we have connectivity through different points. So the main challenge is to reduce the cost because there are some segments that cross different countries and states that involve 
taxes or charges that we have to pay for this transit. As a result of that, connectivity might have a higher impact or the cost of broadband with, in terms of connectivity can be higher compared to other countries. So first we have the facility, the option to access these, and this involves making efforts on the side of the government to reduce the taxes and at the same time to see how we can improve the relationship with the neighboring countries in order to improve that connectivity. Very good point. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here sharing these ideas with all of you. I want to thank LACNIC for giving me this opportunity for inviting us as internet service providers here in the country. One of the key difficulties that we find for connectivity, first of all, is our location as a country, as a landlocked uh, country. We have no access to submarine cables, so that really hampers interconnection because we depend on connectivity of the neighboring countries of using part of the infrastructure and hence we have some issues because of a distance investment and the uh, time of response due to uh, infrastructure issues and some problems that as when we access uh, that connectivity with submarine cables, we are prone to connectivity problems. So one of the key factors that we can highlight in this case is by uh, also adding to the minister's uh, comment is investment so that we can have more connectivity uh, options, despite the fact that today we are directly connected with countries and companies that provide us direct uh, access to sub those submarine cables. Thank you, Attilu. What do you think? Uh, so, Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want to compliment what has already been said by our colleagues in the panel. I think that some years ago, the greatest difficulty was that being a Mediterranean uh, country, the problem that was uh, to what extent uh, the countries that had access to cables. So, um, so we didn't have such robust uh, connectivity and with the necessary bandwidth, but today Today, um, the things change, but uh, what has also changed is uh, the perspective because the uh, competition between ISPs was very strong. Today, we collaborate, and in that regard, we can say that the market uh, proper is uh, offering better ways for connection, and we are looking for mechanism to preserve the content within our territory. So there are several strategies that uh, uh, provide us a much healthier ecosystem in terms of content and connection, and even competitors, all the uh, st local stakeholders have to improve their availability or the number of uh, links they have uh, um, with the exterior. So we are going through many changes. Our country could become a technological hub because we the conditions are there. So this is my personal perspective. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Adelante, Carlos. Su punto de vista. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, your view as an IXP. Good morning, everyone. Yes. Uh, echoing what you just said. Although the issue of expanding the transportation lines is a challenge, both in transport in terms of transport and access, maybe some years ago our fiber optic was only 3,000 uh, kilometers long, but now it's uh, one, oh, just one of the operators that uh, they have 30,000. You may think it's a lot, we have, but we have a large country. 30, we are only providing service to uh, um, uh, part of uh, our population. There are small um, uh, cities that don't have uh, access. Uh, we saw that a cell 
Our spot would only cover 60% of our territory. And two years ago, we saw that, for instance, more than 3 million people didn't have any mobile coverage, for instance. So sometimes it would seem that uh, we are doing a lot, but in fact, it's not enough. On the other hand, one of the challenges that we face today in, t in terms of intercollection in Bolivia, it is mandatory to uh, share infrastructure, but in fact, when you travel to Peru, for instance, you uh, see in the Highway 7, fiber optic cables that are doing the same. So sometimes the infrastructure is redundant because you are not uh, meeting, uh, complying with the regulatory uh, demands. Another important thing is what you said. By August 2022, the megabit average was $2.90. I don't know the other countries' figure, but I get, think it's high, and I think Paraguay may have the same problem. And uh, the same applies to importing uh, equipment, sometimes importing and exporting uh, um, to other countries is uh, too expensive. Thank you, Carlos, for your point of view. Now. We have a question for Minister Gustavo. From the perspective of government, what are the key policies or regulatory frameworks that are needed to promote a more robust connectivity in Paraguay at a regulatory level? First of all, we are promoting a modernization of the Telecom Act that is already quite old. On the other hand, we are trying to um, extend uh, the licenses uh, of operators, especially in terms of wireless connectivity of 4G, 5G. It helps a lot when you want to implement uh, the uh, last mile where we see that 5G, m m we see many of the opportunities that we offer, especially in those places where it's difficult to arrive with a fiber optic infrastructure. So it's very important to continue to promote it. We are close to launch the uh, uh, tender for 5G, but we are tr trying to see how we can help promote investment to provide uh, better coverage and uh, not uh, so much for charging, because we see that this, this has been a common mistake in other countries. So we are to promote coverage, implementation, and investment, and not so much thinking of uh, uh, the company's pockets, because in the end, it goes against the digital divide uh, reduction. On the other hand, we are working in a bill on infrastructure that may enable us to overcome uh, the obstacles that we have in governments in the municipalities or uh, local governments where sometimes we see tax barriers that uh, hinder the implementation of fiber optic or wireless. So that is what we are seeing in the last mile. On the other hand, in Mercosur, Mercosur has signed an agreement well, and it, signed, it was signed in 2017, speaking of a digital agenda, and point two is infrastructure, but in practice, this has not been implemented. We are trying to put that on the table again so that connectivity and physical infrastructure may really become key players so that the digital infrastructure may really lead uh, digital economy and other issues that will help strengthen the entire region. Thank you. Now, Walter, we know that fiber has become the key uh, access uh, to of people to internet services, especially in remote areas. We, uh, we've seen several examples. What were the main uh, challenges and barriers that you as fiber optic operators have seen in Uruguay, in Paraguay, when expanding your fiber optic network. Well, just as you mentioned, Wesley, Paraguay has very distant uh, areas. We are very centralized uh, country, but uh, there are areas far away. So as a company, we saw 
the need to make an effort so that we so as to expand our infrastructure in the cities where we operate at present. So one of the greatest difficulties that we found was the lack, on the one hand, the lack of uh, efficient labor in uh, at the beginning especially. We didn't have any skilled workers. And then the uh, operational costs, and then the uh, policy part, licenses, uh, leasing costs of, of the infrastructure, we had to deal with that too. And also, when and with that, well, well, we uh, had a monopoly. We 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 had to fight against monopoly. We were one of the companies that uh, had uh, to uh, um, try to to uh, reduce the cost for our colleagues that are. Uh, connectivity providers, because we know that in the past the transport cost of the service uh, was very high, so it made it quite hard to provide access to connectivity, and hence the end users had to pay too much for a connection. But fortunately, thanks to initiatives, uh, partly with government and uh, the private effort, we managed to expand our network. At present, uh, we are already operating and contributing to improve connectivity in our country. Thank you. Well, actually, in recent years, I've seen that the private companies are playing a very important role, essentially in the development and deployment of the fiber optic in uh, the country, and hence in approaching the end user to connectivity services. But we know that data centers are also very important in that regard. And now, Victor, the data centers, of course, they are important. We need uh, to post um, all the contents that you have access to come from a data center. How do you see the role of the data center in the strategy of connecting uh, a landlocked country? Thank you, Wesley. You mentioned, yes, indeed, the data center is a very important and silent uh, a player in all the life cycle of the internet because everything goes through there and the data centers are basically sites that uh, have availability and that to meet uh, design and construction uh, standards and operations in their operations to ensure that the content the place where isps are going to uh, connect may meet minimal requirements so that the content owners will be available when needed so the data center plays a key role in this life cycle of the internet because basically it depends merely on well there are several uh, factors, not just geography. In the case of our country, when we say that we have more and better paths to the submarine cables, well, latency won't change, distance won't change, that will remain constant, but there may be changes in uh, bringing contents to the end user. And in that regard, the data center plays an essential role because the content basically remains in the data centers. When we speak of uh, certified data centers, the Uptime Institute, that is the uh, a company that created the standards, uh, that certified the design, the construction, and the operations of the data center, so um, if by meeting those uh, very rigorous standards, this uh, Paraguay uh, appears in the map of uh, content providers. As a matter of fact, when we certified our first data center in, in uh, there was a pin was added in the map where Paraguay is. So the vendors come, Google, the brands, uh, Google, uh, Facebook, Akamai, 
um, as they see that we have a certified data center, they approach us to see how they can provide content to end users. So there are many beneficial things, not just to end users, but also for ISPs, because the bandwidth remains within the territory, improving uh, the customer experience and customer experiences, um, improving accessibility and content. So we can say that the data center actually plays a key role. And the uh, center that uh, is a, uh, a tool that you know also plays a key role here. All right, thank you for your contribution. I see, and adding to what you said, a very important thing of the data centers, and this is something that I share with all of you, is so data, data sovereignty. Many countries share fiscal data, sensitive uh, data in data centers of other countries. And as Victor already says, that worsens the experience. Generar una factura electrónica. This is because locally you need to access an e invoice or access system that is located in the data center of another country. So we're sharing that data. So it's always important to contribute to local data centers to improve the autonomy and the data sovereignty of our country. Carlos, traffic exchange points are essential. We are aware of this. But how can these help? How can they contribute to reduce operational costs of the ISPs in your specific cases? In the case of Bolivia, how did ISPs manage to take advantage of being connected to a traffic exchange point? I will start with a bit of history. In November 2013, we started to operate with one single switch and also with a state operator. This was on the 11th floor in Awakucho with Intel's telephone system. So we started operating with 19 megabits. By that time, at that time, there were only five ISPs connected to the traffic exchange point. Since 2001, and maybe uh, uh, my colleague remembers this, but we have been trying to have a traffic exchange point in Bolivia since 2001, but each country, each region has its specificities. And it is not the same thing. We're never going to be like Brazil. We're never going to be like Argentina. We are Bolivia. We're like Paraguay. We have our own specificities. Maybe in Paraguay, you have neutral entities, maybe prices are more affordable in Paraguay compared to Bolivia. So. Uh, looking back at what we had at the time and we have today, uh, uh, two weeks ago, I saw we had 64 autonomous systems overall. They are directly, 15 are connected directly, 15 autonomous systems, and the customers of the major ISPs, we uh, they, we force them to connect to the traffic exchange. So that 19 megas became 60 gigas to date. So one day they might be doing the cable maintenance work and there was a two minute interruption. It's enough for producing care. So that is when we realized, like Alejandro Guzman was saying, soccer, national taxes, bank transactions, and we were quite afraid because we had also the um, major organizations involved. So they said, you are like the chickens, some will be like the goose with the golden eggs. But even the board of ATT said, I now realize that the traffic exchange point is critical infrastructure. This happened at 10 a.m. So you can imagine how complex this was. That is when we realized how important traffic exchange points are. All the banks are connected, universities are connected, companies are connected, 
there is a company called Halasoft. They are also connected to the traffic exchange point, universities, and the other advantage is the following. Imagine Bolivia has heights from 200 meters above sea level to 4,000 meters above sea level. So the, um, quite a significant difference in terms of heights. So Santa Cruz, which is 200 meters above sea level, has to go up to the traffic east point located 3,600 meters above sea level. So they all have to reach the traffic exchange point for, from the location where they are. So we have had issues building this traffic exchange point. What we see the commitment of the state, we see the commitment of the ISPs at technical level, at legal level. I am the general manager of the IXP, but behind me we have a technical team, we have a legal team that support these ISPs and contribute to its growth. And economically speaking, we realized that the megabit at the traffic exchange point cost six dollar cents compared to the 2.90 US dollars that they cost elsewhere. So we see there are major efforts made. So that would be all. So once again, we'd like to listen to the minister of an, an interesting point. What is the role that public partnership par uh, roles play to improve the connectivity infrastructure in the country. This is from your point of view. Well, first of all, for us, this is a most relevant tool, namely to continue promoting private investments. But there are scenarios where that public-private partnership plays a yet more important role. We see, I'm going to refer to another production item that has nothing to do with technology but has is very important and which is road construction today we are finishing an agreement with the ministry of public works so that any roads that are built includes the tri ducts this will facilitate the necessary trunks of the fiber optic. Paraguay seems to be a small country compared to Brazil and Paraguay, but we are larger than Germany, but our population density is far smaller. We have 6.2 million inhabitants. So connectivity does pose a challenge, but it also has the advantage that the terrain is relatively flat and not we don't have the difficulties that the colleague from Bolivia was referring to. So we do have some advantages. We have disadvantages, but Paraguay has a disadvantage. And I'm now going to speak about connectivity so and data centers. So as I was saying, Paraguay has abundance of electricity, of power available. And this is an advantage we have. These are green energy sources. Sources. We have renewable energy sources, and this is attractive for setting up these data centers in addition to the climate conditions. We have no major events that might affect facilities such as these. We have a stable macroeconomy. We have a low taxes, we have the triple 10 regime. So this makes Paraguay quite attractive for the region. In addition to that, the location, although being a landlocked country might be an issue, but it does have the opportunity of bringing together, of integrating the region. And if we have a look at the map, we see that there are uh, subsea cables connecting to Europe, to Asia, so going, connecting the bioceanic uh, road that will connect Mato Grosso in Brazil, which is one of the areas with the greatest growth in Brazil. This will connect the northern parts of Argentina and Chile. So this involves logistics, but we should also be connecting, providing digital connectivity and fiber optics. This will be a major step and a substantial improvement regarding the delay. This is a bioceanic 
connectivity. And this will be a major, most relevant regarding regional connectivity. So once again, the challenges we face are also opportunities. These are opportunities we have as a region. How do we make this a more integrated region in terms of logistics, in terms of trade, in terms of business exchanges, and also regarding digital exchange. So this is precisely the highway that we need to integrating the region, a region that is more committed with the global connectivity. This region has a lot of advantages in terms of connectivity, but also for example, in our region, we have no conflicts, as you might see in other parts of the world. But we need to become more integrated. So this connectivity that we can achieve through digital connectivity, through fiber optics, if we manage to raise this to the political level and not only discuss this at a technical level, we realize the relevance and the need of achieving this integration. I think this will have a strong impact regarding the reduction of the digital divide and therefore an impact on the digital economy as well as an exponential growth. So to sum up, we have an enormous opportunity as a region. Paraguay can play a key role in setting up these data centers and we continue to grow in this regional integration while promoting the increase of digital connectivity. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. We'll now give the floor to Walter. Could you share with us a success story of, on the deployment of fiber optic deployment in Paraguay from the standpoint of the company you work for? Yes, at GigaNet, I can tell you about something that might be related to this case. We see a slide over here. GigaNet is an interdisciplinary team where we're always trying to find solutions that can make a contribution to this topic. So we always say we always say that we have to take connectivity into account. We set goals in order to try and improve connectivity in the region and therefore in our country. At present, we have an interconnection, as you can see on this slide, which is as follows. We have international connectivity where we are present in the red lines and the yellow lines are limited deployments we have in the country. In 2016, we embarked on the challenge of figuring out connection through fiber optics with Brazil. So the first companies outside beyond the telephone companies and private companies had the aim of achieving fiber optic connectivity with Brazil. Despite all the difficulties we faced at the time, we finally managed to have the first connection with Brazil through a fiber optic network that crossed the river Parana. Very often people don't believe that. And when I tell that story, people just don't believe it. And it is quite true. This is something that we celebrated very much. At present with Brazil, we have four connections. We always try to find ways of guaranteeing the service to our customers. A year ago, we began the first connection with Argentina, and a couple of months ago, a second connection with Argentina. These connections are specifically for a traffic exchange point project, which is IXD, of which GigaNet is part. We're also working on projects, working together with 
the traffic exchange point in Chile. So this will be make our connection more reliable for our customers. Now, referring to data centers once again, which are the specific challenges both for developing and maintaining data centers in countries that have no access to sea? Well, we spoke about the relevance of designing a data center and that these designs are also approved. Construction has have to comply with what was designed for that purpose. We have design and construction, and there is what the real work begins. This is the operation and sustainability of that data center over time, because we are aware that if a construction meets all the standards, meets all the requirements, if these are not maintained over time, it is not sustainable. So the most difficult part of all this life cycle is having been at the forefront, because those who are pioneers have to be the first to do something. Nobody can convey previous knowledge, so we have to be in contact with people from the region who can tell us more about how to construct a data center. And this is a contribution to the knowledge of countries. So that is where we start with the operations of the data center. With that aim, you need to have a heterogeneous team, because for electrical, mechanical part, you need to have different types of engineers and experts. For the higher layers of the service, you need a NOG. For the infrastructure, you need to have personnel dedicated 100% to this. We're speaking about a working team that supplements the, the different talents, and these have to do with the different roles they play in that process. And of course, uh, the monitoring uh, and uh, the uh, maintenance uh, timetable, because it is there that we have the real the uh, uh, costs of the data centers, so that uh, they can continue to meet uh, their certifications. And the data centers bring uh, infrastructure to the community and companies, because basically, what a data center does is uh, makes infrastructure available. The, that is very difficult to make available if you are going to invest. Uh, it democratizes the availability of data and it makes it available for companies and uh, uh, and uh, customers. So we uh, the data centers help uh, meet standards that would be very difficult for an individual. Um, so we you, we need to be very rigorous to design and to construct, but the true challenge where we have to devote more attention to is operations. So everything, all those, the data center operators, uh, we all understand that uh, we must uh, provide uh, services to um, uh, and to customers in, in a sustainable manner. Thank you, Victor. And really, essentially in small countries like Paraguay and Bolivia, uh, uh, getting uh, skilled labor and meeting standards is a challenge, and you're doing a good job. My friend Carlos Sanabria, what are the technical and regulatory challenges faced by the IXPs in the, uh, landlocked countries, and how can those challenges be overcome? Thank you. Well, the Bolivian IXP is a non-profit uh, entity. Everything that uh, enters is uh, for operations. Uh, there are there's no profit, and the same applies to investment. So. Uh, a piece of equipment may cost uh, $15,000, uh, uh, 20 percent is paid on equal terms, and uh, 80 percent is traffic. For is we have a peculiarity. In 2020, there was an attempt to nationalize the IXP, and this year we had a similar thing. It's sort of as the the IXP in Bolivia became uh, had turned into candy. We're going to have a control of all the internet if it belongs to a, uh, a state. But in general terms, what we try to do is well. We know we want to be in peace with everybody in good terms with the government, with the XPs, with all the sect, with ISPs and all the sectors. And something as we are not too many, 
and we are so-called machos, we, you can coordinate with almost everybody. There are issues, for instance, in the deployment of RPK, I just to mention one. Individually, ISP, by ISP, for instance, of the 43% that we had uh, two and a half years ago now, it's above uh, 91, for instance. We uh, still make mistakes. For instance, last week we had an event with the banks. We were going to sign an agreement with the, the ASA Bank, the private uh, association of banks in Bolivia, to find uh, common uh, issues of technology, because the, the internet, in addition to all the hardware, is an element for the development of the country. So it it's, uh, cuts uh, across all of the economic areas. Another challenge we face, and we have quite, uh, we are quite open. If we want to reach uh, Santa Cruz, there are several institutions, not just ISPs, but universities or even banks that have, that tell us, come to Santa Cruz, let's uh, create a node in uh, Santa Cruz, and the same in Tarija and Cochabamba. So it, the conditions are there for the IXP to develop. And that is one of the key challenges. As a matter of fact, the first step that we'll, uh, will be to take a, a root server to Santa Cruz so that we may have at the DNS level, we may have geographic redundancy so that the network operators in Santa Cruz may exchange the local traffic in Santa Cruz. Well, that sort of action, that's what we're doing. Thank you. Well, really, uh, Minister, I would like to hear your view. We know that Paraguay is a very good country for investment. As a matter of fact, investment in Paraguay always thrive. So how is it that from the point of view of government, can you incentivize the local operators to invest more? to create new infrastructure in Paraguay for the deployment of fiber optic and technology? Well, first of all, it's important to have a dialogue to understand. I will, well, I said that we are in constant uh, dialogue with the different stakeholders, ISPs and operators. Well, what we aim at is to understand their challenges today. One of them is the uh, infrastructure bill and uh, the concessions of more ex than five years uh, to 15, 20 years because of the significance of the investment. Uh, but uh, especially what we see is how to promote the investment as we have remote sites, for instance, where we use low orbit satellites that can help um, although they are relatively expensive for the end users, they can be good for connect remote connectivity and not to have a trunk with that is much more expensive and you don't even have the infrastructure to reach that place in indigenous communities or remote communities that require this type of services to connect to the world and offer uh, craftsmanship or other things or even the use of tools for education so we see how these enablers or these scenarios may help con us continue to grow in infrastructure. And as I said earlier, the use or the generation of physical infrastructure so that uh, passing to fiber optic would be faster and more efficient, uh, reducing operational costs uh, as you don't have, for instance, you're not prone uh, to traffic accidents or fires that make uh, operations much more costly. So that helps promote private investment uh, so that the deployment of fiber may continue to grow and the deployment of connectivity at a national level. So first of all, having clear rules is very important and we are working on regulations, not just from, uh, not just at 
to Congress, the way we have a good talk with the two houses, but also with the regulatory agencies, that is Conatel, where we continue to work uh, in uh, a dialogue with the private sector to so that we can continue to generate uh, the conditions and the rules for the private sector to continue to invest and to grow and also the commitment of Peña, uh, President Peña that from day one of his campaign has said that there will be no increase in taxes or fees. So we, our country will become increasingly formal and with more investment so that the country may continue to grow, but always clarifying that the taxes won't be raised. So those low taxes and clear rules and showing that Paraguay is growing the right way, the investment grade that was just obtained by the country, many people don't realize how important that is. But in more than 10 years, no countries have achieved that. and. Paraguay did. So there's an institutionality. There's a respect for the standards and the general management of the conditions enabling the country to continue to thrive. And I think that that is important for a private uh, investment to come, to continue to generate the conditions to reduce the digital divide and make that a reality. Thank you. That's an excellent point of view. And it can really contribute a lot for the private companies to continue to invest. Walter. What strategies or technolo alternative technologies do you consider that could complement the use of fiber optic or increase or improve the use of fiber optic in uh, Mediterranean countries? Well, as a company that provides connectivity services and transportation to many of our customers, we are focused at present we to interconnecting to IXPs at a national level. IXPs distributed uh, across the country, and in that image, there are some active uh, IXPs that we try to reach with interconnection so that we can bring contents to more service providers so that they can also have a more uh, direct, a closer interconnection, precisely to avoid such high costs of uh, an interconnectivity of an, an ISP to an IXP. So, and with respect to technologies, before going to that last thing, in that chart, precise. We show that the transportation of data is contributing to the IXP. We are reaching peaks of 60 giga. That is uh, our current interconnection with the participants of the IXP. And as to technologies that may contribute with connectivity of the fiber optic networks, it's the new technologies the wireless and satellite, that uh, a low orbit satellites, IXPs that make, may significantly contribute to fiber optic connectivity for users. Thank you, Walter, for your contribution. It's really very variable, valuable. Once again, speaking of data centers, and uh, speaking of sustainability and efficiency, how can data centers adapt to the needs and geographical constraints of the countries that uh, have no coast? Well, when we speak of the present, but especially the future, we see a 
change in the trend of construction of data centers. In the past, there were very large data centers that hosted many racks, uh, great density, especially because the return on investment got diluted among all uh, in the data center, and it was much easier to build uh, a business case and build that data center. But today, there is a tendency that complements that. Of course, that uh, the very big data centers will continue to exist, but now there is a trend that has to do with the way we consume traffic. Years ago, it was that uh, the client would download information from the internet, but now the clients are also generating a lot. Uh, so we have to speak of the border data centers that are much, much smaller, much closer to the end customer. So we that uh, provides a better experience, and it also makes it possible for the client to generate information not that is not only accessible, but processed as close as possible to that uh, end customer. So we, 5G is already, uh, we are hearing about it louder and louder. It's uh, coming in the f uh, forthcoming years, and it will require data centers that are closer to the end clients. Regarding how we generate and consume information, it is impossible to leave aside artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things. We have statistics that show that an autonomous car, which we still don't have in the region, but it is likely that they will be here shortly, produces for eight hours of driving 40 tera in terms of communications. This has to be processed in real time. The you can have no latency whatsoever because we know what is at stake. So we say that a large amount of information is processed over a short period of time, and quite obviously, this should provide the best experience possible. So we say that trends are chaining, changing. In fact, the different issues are being supplemented. We'll have the border data centers, which will be the satellites, and this and we will have 5G very soon. The graph you can see on the screen is very interesting because this speaks about the development of the international capacity we, we have had and how this has evolved since 2014. These are 10 years of history. And we see exp an exponential growth. We see that at least the statistics I have show that we have 900 giga of consumption of international capacity, and this is also was also enhanced by the pandemic and by the hybrid forms of working and studying. This is a reality. So we're going to need more and better connections, international connections, but also more and better data centers that can respond to this significant growth in the demand. And this won't stop because we'll continue evolving in terms of technology, and therefore the consumption habits will also change. Thank you very much. Here we have another slide. A question for Carlos. What initiatives are you working on in Bolivia to improve internal and external connections? And what are the lessons learned? regarding the traffic exchange point and that you can sh share with other landlocked countries so as to learn from your case. Can we have the next slide, please? This is just to give you an example. In Bolivia, we have seven ISPs that have international exit, their own in exit. And this is the example of the state-owned operator. They deployed an optic infrastructure from Bolivia to the neighboring country of Peru. The deployed network covers 2,200 kilometers. 1,000 kilometers are combined terrestrial and air connection, and it has two branches from the Saguadero to the Ilo region in Peru. And from there, the state operator has its own path through submarine connection to Lurin, which is close to Lima. The rings integrate Tacna, Tarata, Masocruz, Huaytire, Moquegua, Molienda, 
at the south of Peru. In those localities, eight transmission stations were set up to provide connection, and the technology employed is WDM, which is a wavelength. This allows deploying a total capacity of 80 100 gigabit channels. This is the exploitable capacity reaches 8 terabits per second. Something similar to this was done by the private sector. They have built rings. And if I look at the transport networks in Brazil and Argentina or Chile, and looking at these, one can note, like a panelist mentioned once, these networks are close to the sea. In the case of Brazil, you have Sao Paulo, Rio, Fortaleza, all those cities are in the proximity of the sea. And the same happens with Peru. In Peru, it's along the coast. But if you look at this map of Bolivia, which is from one single operator, initially we had three international exits. But now we have the trunk and have linked the 300 municipalities. And now we have 11 international exits. And with the friends from Paraguay, we have a traffic exchange point in Puerto Sucre at the south of Bolivia in the department of Chuquisaca. And at some binational meeting, we spoke about interconnecting the traffic exchange points. This does have its complexities, but we have been discussing this topic. So as you can see, regarding this specific operator, covers 21,000 kilometers of fiber optics. The access network is of 16 plus thousand kilometers, and the transport network covers 2,300 kilometers. So the ISPs and the country as such are doing their homework, their work. But in the internet not only depends on the ISPs. You have a value chain involving the content providers, the content distribution networks, and at the end of the day, we all have to work, walk at the same pace. Technology does not evolve on its own. You have individuals, you have realities that have to accompany this process. This slide summarizes the situation of Bolivia regarding fixed access to the Internet. As you can see, the predominating technology is fiber optics. Some of you might think this is nothing special, but in 2012, Bolivia only had a fixed internet penetration of 9%. At present, this is 60%. And in fact, the dominating service in Bolivia is no longer mobile telephony. Mobile telephony is dropping. And this might occur in other countries, I guess. And fixed internet is now exceeding the amount of mobile phone connections. This has probably happened in other countries, too, but this is our reality here. So firm steps are being taken so that we can have a better internet in the country through greater connectivity, both in terms of transport and access. Thank you very much. So these are interesting lessons learned that you can share with other countries. We have now a final question, which is addressed to all the members of the panel. This, I would like to start with Walter. Looking into the future, what are the innovations or what are the technological innovations that you think are of key importance so that landlocked countries can overcome connectivity challenges? Well, looking into the future and adding on to the topic of connectivity through fiber optics, I estimate that with the arrival of 5G to our country, 
This will be a major contribution to connectivity with greater capacity. And with that, many technologies, many emerging technologies will now be used more efficiently. Wireless hypercapacity connectivity without leaving aside artificial intelligence in this case. So all this will mm, contribute and we have to take into account cybersecurity. So we have a, a mechanism that will add to fiber connectivity and this will make things more efficient in the future. Thank you, Walter. Attilio, what is your standpoint? What are the innovations that you think will be important? So hand in hand with what the colleagues in the panel were commenting on, the important thing is that we are aware of the need to work together. Like the minister mentioned, the best spirit is there to modify the laws so as to attract international investments, and this really feeds the market. So I think we're on the right path. But basically, when we refer to data centers, there is an awareness of the need of having these data centers. Basically, this will contribute to making a more robust ecosystem. This will raise the standard in the country, and this will allow all of us to grow. I firmly believe that geography is a factor we have in our favor because we don't have the risk of natural accidents. We have green power. We have cheap power. So this will attract foreign investment and will allow this market to become a technological hub for the region. And we also have a favorable climate in all senses. I think we are on the right path. The data center will pay, play a fundamental role, and this will be also supplemented by connectivity, by 5G, by fiber optics, which involve more and more kilometers of connections. This will, as a result, lead to having a more mature market without forgetting that we have more and more connected homes. Statistics in that case will become exponential. As a result, the entire ecosystem will become more and more mature. So that is the vision we have. Thank you very much. Carlos. Well, what I see is the next step is 5G. What I have heard from the government is that the G band is 28 million, but in the the G set, but in the 5G we speak about 130 million. So basically, this could be a barrier for access. But behind all that, 5G is also associated to the development of your passion, the development of IPv6. The good news is that Bolivian operators, and this is uh, uh, news, there are major Bolivian operators that are now starting to migrate to IPv6. And even in terms of the user's routers, not only in the transport layer, but also in access layer and the core layer. But this is progress that is taking place. And what we see is up and coming in terms of traffic will have to be routed through the traffic exchange point. So all the paths lead to the traffic exchange point. And the good thing about this is that we view this as something positive. We try to be neutral in our position so as not to respond to the government or to the ISPs or to any other organization. We don't check the origin and destination of the traffic. We don't prioritize any type of traffic. We don't do any filtering. So this topic will be based on trust, on building trust. 
in terms of technology, 5G will be quite disruptive. Yes, certainly. Uh, Mr. Minister, which are the innovations that you think will be relevant from the technological standpoint so we can continue to make progress and we continue to reduce the divide as well as improve our statistics of users, graphs, and broadband consumption? I'm convinced that this is not just one reason, but it's the combination of several events, 5G, low-orbit satellites, IoT, artificial intelligence. Low-orbit satellites, we are an agro-exporting country and will remain to be so. We're going to use technology to continue to increase the current exports we have. Like you said, we have a little over 6 million inhabitants, but we generate we produce food for more than 80 million inhabitants. So this continues to grow with the use of technology. If, in turn, we start producing better in the field and we use uh, IoT and uh, smart harvesters and uh, the use uh, of uh, uh, technology, this will continue to grow. Now, as to 5G, what gives us access to this uh, last mile at uh, uh, fast speed, it gives us density and, uh, and um, it uh, helps us in uh, many aspects. AI, the, two, the, the barrier, we are only seeing the inception of uh, artificial intelligence. We are far from our recommendation and uh, we well, we need to continue to promote the regulatory um, things, but we we can't regulate uh, just uh, on the basis of the beginning, and we shouldn't uh, create barriers. But the most important barriers for um, AI will not be given by technology, but uh, the uh, power uh, consumption, because it's uh, very are power consuming and, and Paraguay has a huge advantage not only that uh, we are 100 uh, percent renewable and uh, clean energy but uh, we consume only 30 percent of the energy we produce so today we already have that potential and not just that Itaipu a dam that was created, that was uh, built uh, 50 years ago with the same amount of water, they can generate 40 percent more energy just by changing the turbines that were uh, built uh, um, especially for uh, the dam. So it and it has uh, a part uh, that has a huge potential that has not been opened yet. But another important issue is the possibility of having solar panels. Just the Itaipu Dam, that uh, is uh, a thousand kilometer, square kilometers, can generate three times as energy as Itaipu with the solar energy. We, so we believe that uh, artificial intelligence will be a key player in Paraguay because of the potential that we have today, not tomorrow, but today. We have a surplus of renewable energy and the potential for growth that we still have. So. We are fully convinced that we have all the potential to continue to grow and moving forward to a general, a regional integration, enhancing digital um, uh, artificial intelligence, but because the fact that uh, an, an AI um, uh, a data center may install in uh, Paraguay or in Brazil or in Bolivia helps the entire region, not just in the country where it will generate an ecosystem, but attracting and promoting regional integration. So I'm fully convinced that we have a very encouraging present and an even better future. Thank you for your point of view, Minister. Well, we see that we have a lot of work ahead. We've already reduced uh, the gap, and that can only be done through alliances between government, private companies, data centers, and IXPs. 
that uh, should be a model for other countries to to anticipate to do their best to interconnect people because beyond uh, the fact of uh, transporting uh, data and 15 kilometers of fiber optic we're speaking of people so a round of applause for our panelists thank you